Welcome to Critical Thinking Live, Friends of Europe's offering where we bring you leaders from the worlds of politics, private sectors of society, both within Europe and outside in the wider world, to talk about politics and matters of the day, the key topics that are affecting us here in Europe, but also globally. And we bring you this on a regular basis, so please do keep on an eye on our website for future events. But today, I'm ex very pleased to be able to welcome the Minister of Defence from Portugal. As many of you know, uh, the uh, Portuguese have the presidency of the EU and so it's a timely conversation with the Minister of Defence on peace security defence matters. It gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, the Minister of Defence of Portugal, uh, João uh, Cravinho. João, very well, very warm welcome to you. It's good to see you with us. Mm -hmm. I know you, you mm -hmm. spent some time last year at our State of Europe Roundtable where you spoke about challenges of peace and security defence at our annual event. But today is an opportunity for you and I to have a conversation in the context of the presidency uh, around what matters and what are the issues and the challenges ahead. So a very warm welcome to you, Joao. Good Thank to you see you. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here, Dermendra. Delighted to be with Friends of Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Joao. Joao, if I can start by asking you about your reflections about Peace, security, defence matters. The number of changes that are taking place in within Europe, but also our neighbourhood. We have a new US administration with a different tone uh, and a sentiment towards the EU. As the, the, the minister in charge of defence matters during the presidency uh, of the EU, give us your reflections on what you think are the key issues in, in relation to peace, security, defence. I think you're absolutely right to uh, make this reference to the change of administration in the US. The uh, presidencies, the role of the presidency is uh, always, of course, to uh, take things forward in the particular uh, time frame in which the presidency occurs. And in this time frame, we have this change of administration. So that's a very major factor that we have to take on board. Uh, as well, of course, as uh, combining it with some of the elements of value added that we think we can bring to the table. So we're seeking to do both. With respect to the moment that we're living, the change in the US administration, of course, is relevant. Also, the fact that internally we're coming to a crucial stage of the development of our strategic compass. This is the semester in which the creative thinking has to happen uh, before the nitty gritty work of writing during next semester and the approval uh, early in 2022. So we're focused on that. We're focused on EU-NATO relations at a moment when uh, we are developing our conceptual document, the strategic compass, and NATO is equally working on its NATO 2030 document, which will uh, provide the basis in all likelihood for a new strategic concept in 2022. So these are major factors. And then in terms of uh, some value added that we believe we can bring to the table, I would suggest um, our focus on Africa is relevant and our focus on a specific aspect, which has been, I think, a little bit um, uh, underrepresented in previous thinking in uh, EU defense identity, which is the maritime security aspect. Mm -hmm. We need to bring that into our way of thinking about the future of European defense. So we work in, in this context of a very rapidly changing world mm -hmm. with positive changes, positive changes, namely the US administration and also in uh, Europe itself as we come together with a common threat analysis and a common um, and, a, and a desire to establish the common basis for uh, our uh, strategic thinking yep. with the strategic compass. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm confident that we will be able to move forward on various of these very important aspects during these uh, six months of our presidency. So therefore, th thank you. you, you drew large, which is really helpful. And I want to come back to some of the points you made around strategic compass, uh, uh, strategic autonomy, and what about Africa? But for the moment, let's stick with the presidential uh, uh, priorities of the presidency. Say a little bit more for our audience about in the context you've just pointed out and the issues that are important to you, very specifically, what do you want to be able to shift or create highlights at, or a priority around during your presidency? Well, I think that during our presidency, I would like to arrive at the end of uh, June uh, this year, hand over to the Slovenian presidency that we've been already been working in with in the context of the, the trio, Germany, Portugal, Slovenia, to hand over to them um, 
I would say, consolidated uh, political level thinking uh, with respect to the strategic compass. So far, there has been a lot of good technical level pro progress. We need to give the political input, bringing ministers around the table to discuss um, uh, the, uh, at the political level what, how we can think of Europe as a strategic actor in a complex multipolar world. Mm -hmm. We'd like to hand that over. We'd like to hand over to the Slovenian presidency also, I would say a reset of relations with the United States, part of which is covered by NATO and part of which is, is autonomous. And um, I, I would like also to be able, during the uh, course of the presidency, to see the, the, the full establishment of our um, coordinated maritime presences in the Gulf of Guinea, giving us for the first time significant strategic value in the maritime uh, sector. We've had missions in the past and ongoing, Atalanta, Irini, but um, coordinated maritime presence is in the Gulf of Guinea. It's an experiment, it's a pilot project, and it is a way, I think, of reconciling the difficulty that we have in uh, making our, um, uh, I would say, our political ambitions uh, the same as our capacity to put military assets uh, on the ground or on water in this case. Joao, that's very helpful. What about money? You know, at the moment, we've got the largest rollout of, if we might, if we might call it a kind of a social safety net uh, or public spending on public tax, if there's a taxpayer's money to bail out the EU. You, we have a situation where ministers such as yourself will be vying with other ministers about budgets uh, in domestic economies. Tell us a little bit about, share your thoughts in terms of how will the budgetary process and the kind of planning process that's taking place now for recovery funds affect the budgets relating to peace, security, peace, peace and security in particular, domestic. Do you see that as being a challenge or, 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 or a, a, an opportunity in the coming years as we look ahead? Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. When we, we're living through a complex uh, crisis, we know the source of this crisis. It's a, it's a crisis that is very different from other ones that have come before because it results from a, a health emergency. And we know also, or we can be confident, that within some months, within a year or so, the situation will be transformed. Nevertheless, uh, many Europeans are hurting badly as a result of this. And there will, of course, be a need to focus support um, financial resources on their, on their recovery. So does this mean that uh, defense matters should take a, a backstage? I would say no for two reasons. Firstly, unfortunately, the threats that are the fundamental reason for us to have an insurance policy that, that, that we call defense, uh, our defense systems, those threats remain there. If anything, they have become aggravated, they have become more evident as a result of the crisis. Secondly, I think that it's important also to recall that as we look at how best to use the recovery fund, uh, all the resources that are being placed at the disposal of member states, we are often saying that we should try to build back better. Mm -hmm. Now, building back better means, I would su suggest, focusing on innovation, focusing on those areas of the economy that are likely to bring greater returns in the future. And in that respect, actually the defense industries are very interesting. And lately in the last uh, two, three years, few years, we've been trying to uh, consolidate European defense industries. This is, I would say, a very good opportunity for us to go further down that road. Uh, at the moment, uh, beginning of May, we will have coming on tap the European Defence Fund. We will we have the European Peace Facility, which is also coming on tap very shortly. Uh, we have our PESCO projects, which are now streamlining. They're beginning to gain momentum. I would say this is a good opportunity for us to focus on how we can use uh, the particular the moment that we're living through as a way of strengthening our defense industries and a way of strengthening our defense posture. So mm -hmm. I realize, of course, that uh, there will be others who say the opposite, who will say mm -hmm. this is a moment to focus on um, butter, not on guns. Mm -hmm. 
I think we've learned some time ago that it's not a question of either or. It's a question of doing both in a manner that uh, promotes, that each promotes the other. And if we're smart about it, we should be able to to uh, to be, uh, leave, to leave ourselves in a better situation. So, Shua, if I can talk, can I just press you a little bit further on that? And this is a challenging question because we know money's going to be tight, budgets are going to be tight. And there's something interesting about what you said is that there's something in the defense industry and uh, as per security capacities there's an element of innovation taking place is there a sense from from your discussions with other ministers that you're all in the same space about having to reinvent secure defense matters in europe in the same way that public administrations are having to rethink radically their purpose and their future role is there a similar dialogue happening amongst ministers of defense um, especially during your presidency Yes, there is. You know, it's interesting because, of course, when we think about traditional uh, defense uh, spending, we look at very, very expensive equipment, you know, new frigates, new planes, and these are come with a tremendous price tag attached to them. But at the same time, what we're seeing very rapidly uh, emerging are the so so-called uh, disrupting disruptive technologies, uh, which can be quite cheap. Uh, they require, of course, uh, innovation, but we are seeing a situation where you no longer have the traditional uh, equation of the more you spend, the better your weaponry, and therefore the greater your chances of, um, of success in any confrontation. And nowadays, it, the issue of spending smart is uh, really going up the ladder of, of priorities. And in Europe, I think some of the PESCO projects are good examples of that. In Europe, we need to be thinking um, about spending smart, not as a way of reducing our expenditure, but as a way of making our expenditure really, really worthwhile uh, to make it uh, really valid and, uh, and capable of achieving the results that we want from it. OK, thank you for that. So therefore, if we flip back to what you just said about um, the importance of innovation and what you just explained, there's a number of kind of um, some, pipe, some people might call it clutter. Others think about it as an ecology. PESCO, CARD, we have the Strategic Compass, European Defence Fund, we have the EAS. Is, is it all coming together in a harmony or is there the, you know, what, what's the chances of it being more than simply talking shops mm -hmm. rather rather than acting out what needs to happen strategically to protect ourselves in the next five to ten years well i, I understand uh, the reason for this question and if one takes a photograph of the current situation then then clearly there are um there are a variety of instances in which we're working and there is a question work a question mark about the way that they all relate to each other but if instead of the photograph we take a moving picture uh, we take uh, we make a little film of it i've i've been defense minister for about two and a half years and mm -hmm. i've seen tremendous change we compare the photograph of today to the photograph of two and a half years ago, and we see a very interesting, uh, very positive evolution. Uh, we have to really remain focused on making sure that the, all these various elements come together. Mm -hmm. But if we do so in another two and a half years, we're going to be in a position which is much better than the one today. So okay, I'm, Shrao, I'm let, me press you. let me press you a second then. What has changed in that photograph, that imagery? Just to make it real for our viewers, you mm -hmm. say, you know, we're in a different and better place. One of the elements, obviously, is that we have a new college of commissioners, um, a majority of women that are leading mm -hmm. Uh, that new institution, which brings a very different tone and style and let's hope more consensual approach, which we know from neuroscience about the, the mix and the blend of between men and women in a decision making space. But from your perspective, give us a couple of examples where you think things have changed for the better. OK, well, um, I mean, with uh, no disrespect to uh, her predecessor, I'm very glad that my former defence colleague is uh, president of the commission. And so not only uh, am, am I pleased to say that the commission is being led by a woman, but mm -hmm. by, she's, it is being led by a woman who has a clear strength, sense of dual strategic relevance, who has a, a deep understanding of the world of defence issues. And uh, I think that the way that the Commission has put forward its priorities, uh, Commission and of course the External Action, Action Service with uh, Borrell, is one that re results from uh, an understanding of the very difficult world that we're all facing. In, in concrete terms, if we look at the card process, 
uh, I would say that you know a couple of years ago, card process was um, perhaps seen by many as a as an attempt to imitate uh, pale imitation of the NATO defense planning process. Indeed. Now uh, nowadays, the card uh, process is offering us very um, valuable insights in how we can make our PESCO projects relevant for what we all need in terms of our uh, capacity uh, requirements, our capacity gaps or capability gaps and so on. And so I think that uh, there on PES on the relationship between PESCO card and uh, the situation in each of our countries, we've got a very positive movement. PESCO itself, of course, uh, is interesting because we've seen a process of weeding out of some of the projects which seemed like good ideas, but in fact have not gained traction on the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, when that happens, well, we need to move on and focus on what, on what works. And so the thinning out of uh, PESCO projects is, is, is positive. And uh, we're seeing already an, a number of large number of PESCO projects, which are going to be producing uh, the results that they aimed at well before 2025, 2024, 2025. It seems a long way away, but defense, uh, when we're talking about the development of new defense capabilities, mm -hmm. actually the time horizon is not that far away. Finally, a point on that um, is that I would, uh, I think that we are also seeing a much greater capacity for convergence between our NATO dynamics and our uh, EU dynamics. Okay. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a sense of, of rivalry uh, on the part of some or fear of rivalry. And nowadays, I think there is an understanding that each can contribute to uh, the other in very substantive ways. And of course, uh, there is a very clear alignment in objectives, which could only be the case given that uh, 21 out of uh, 27 EU member states are also allies in NATO. Indeed, and clearly, I mean, obviously two years ago, there was the big Trump factor that seemed to mess things up on the transatlantic front, but also create total confusion um, and a sense of who's in charge. And actually there was an opportunity for the EU to come together, which it has in many ways in response. But as you say, now we have Ursula van der Leyen who comes with a background with a very clear sense of strategic foresight in this area. And we can see a number of changes happening. And I suppose part of that, and you refer to is I want to tackle those two issues. One is you know, the, the strategic compass. In, when you think about what it's aiming to do, and there's going to be a lot of talk about, there is a lot of talk about it right now. From your perspective, if it's to be really something of value and not a series of plans which respond to an assessment of threats in the next five years, what needs to give? From your perspective, how does the strategic compass really help the EU to be uh, more than the sum of its parts, if you like, or you know, to be much greater um, as a force for good both within, but on its neighborhood and more globally? I think that one of the things that we do need to sort out uh, in the process of discussing the strategic concept is strategic compass is what is, the, what is our level of ambition? What do, mm. what do we want to do as EU? You know, if our borders are uh, invaded, that's a matter for NATO, at least for the vast majority of us. We're in agreement uh, on that. Uh, however, there are, and more and more in, uh, in these uh, more recent times, and perhaps in the foreseeable future, there are many uh, threats that fall short, far short of a conventional uh, attack or conventional invasion. And these are the ones that we are having to deal with. So which of these should we be putting under Article 42.7 uh, of the Lisbon Treaty, mm -hmm. uh, which ones should be part of our level ambition to respond to. Secondly, of course, with respect to the neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, some issue areas, and I would say Libya is one of them, various in, in Sahel, Sub-Saharan Africa, are uh, issue areas that are best dealt with by the European Union. Uh, with NATO support, if possible, of course, and there is um, there are various instances in which NATO has given, for example, uh, intelligence uh, reconnaissance uh, support that has been uh, that has been very useful. 
And, um, but uh, these are matters in which NATO as such is uh, less interested in being engaged and Europe has to be able to respond to. So I, I'm, uh, I'm fairly optimistic about the way that the strategic compass, if we manage to get it right in terms of our political discussions, if we manage to provide it with, um, with, with some sense of, of substance, which cannot come only from the technical uh, level people working Indeed. together and, and, and identifying the minimum common denominator, um, and I believe there will be this kind of political input, then I'm confident that it's going to help direct us in terms of understanding what we want to do together as Europe, which ultimately uh, would be a very major step forward, one that has not yet had a, an answer. Thank you for that, Joao, because that helps kind of, it's a lovely bridge into this next question I have is about strategic autonomy, because you've got the strategic compass, which is obviously based on analysis of threats that are current and emerging. Uh, and then we've got this concept, which has obviously been flying around for a couple of years now, but given much more force and weight uh, in the past 12 months, is of strategic autonomy. Now, for our audience and your perspective, how are you kind of unpacking that term so that in the context of a, a different presidency in the UE, in the US, where you've got someone who brings a return back to a much more collaborative world, a much more multilateral world in the, in the shape of Biden. And then you have this concept of strategic autonomy, which to many might seem as if it's going it alone and we look after ourselves and only our backyard. Explain to us from your perspective, is there a, um, a kind of a contradiction in terms between strategic autonomy and our work with allies and multilateral institutions, but also the transatlantic relationship? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're, you're absolutely right to say that this term strategic autonomy, uh, it's a controversial term, but the nature of the particular controversy changes uh, with Trump in the White House or with Biden in the, in the White House. I think that, uh, you know, the, the, when, when one talks of strategic autonomy, some are immediately led to think of the preposition uh, from and others to think of the preposition for. And strategic autonomy from, of course, leads one to think, well, this is it's from NATO, it's from the US, it's being able to cut those ties. Um, I think that's a major mistake. I think that strategic autonomy for uh, should be about uh, identifying the areas in which NATO is either inappropriate or unwilling, uninterested in intervening, does not see it as part of its mandate, and uh, yet, uh, there are areas that the EU as such cannot um, refrain from identifying as areas of, of security and defense concern for us. And we need to be able to respond to those problems that are in our neighborhood uh, as, as EU. Uh, on the other hand, in many instances, mm -hmm. we will benefit more uh, from our, the proximity that we have with the United States and with NATO, if we are more capable. The United States has for many years been underlying, underlining the importance of European countries doing more for their own defense. And it is only uh, reasonable that they should do so. And they should do so in common, jointly, not uh, in any way uh, weakening or severing the relationship with NATO. I think that would be a mistake. Mm -hmm. I think that we're, uh, as, as uh, EU, uh, we're all, um, we all stand much to gain from strengthening the EU-NATO bond. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we need to be able to face up to our responsibilities alone rather than to say uh, simply, oh, uh, we have the support of the US or we have the support of NATO, let them let them deal with it. So I don't see this as, as contradictory. I do think that the Biden administration really helps us to see the positive and, mm -hmm. to, and to assuage the fears of uh, those who think it would be distancing us from the US. And is that the, the mood music you took away from the recent summit that took place where Borrell spoke and others, and you had Biden obviously joining for the first time, etc. Was that that sense you got from that summit about a very different way of working and looking ahead in terms of global security? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, it's, there's, there's, we have to be very conscious that the U United States geopolitical 
um, situation has actually changed in the past 10, 15 years. Um, what we saw with, with Trump was certainly uh, anomalous uh, for a variety of reasons that, that is not worth going into. But uh, there are fundamental changes that are taking place and Europe has to adapt to those changes. What we have with the Biden administration is uh, a worldview that says, absolutely rightly in my perspective, that the Uni Euro European Union is the best thing that the best friend that the United States has uh, in the transatlantic sphere, but globally as well. And in terms of the values that we, that we hold uh, as important to ourselves. And this means that we have conditions, I believe, with the Biden administration to rethink, because rethinking is necessary. We can't go back to the way things were 10, 20 years ago, but to rethink the, the way that the US and uh, Europe should be working together in a, a context which is very challenging and very different and fast changing. Thank you for that. In terms of, I, before we kind of, um, um, you know, close up this conversation, there's a couple of points I'd like to touch upon with you. And it's, it's about building on what you've just said and thinking about our nearest neighbourhood, if, if you will, Africa and security in Africa. You know, everyone has spoken about this essentially being about Asia, but actually if, if there was the right investment and in infrastructure and actual uh, peace and stability in Africa, you'd see that continent um, leapfrog others. Uh, by, by 20 years, if it had the right conditions and the right engagement and support, if you like. But any thoughts and views about um, secu uh, you know, security in Africa in particular? Some of our citizens have asked questions around, you know, the Sahel in particular. And um, as you know, we'll be bringing out a report later in May uh, where we'll be looking at what are the co issues around cooperation between the EU and the Sahel, Africa in relation to Sahel. Share your thoughts about where you see security matters going in relation to EU-Africa relations. Thank you for your introductory comments on Africa. I fully agree. Uh, Africa has tremendous potential and it's our neighbor. Uh, Africa, if we just look at the demography of Africa, uh, well, uh, Africa can have a tremendous demographic bonus that results from its young population, young growing population, dynamic, or it can be, um, or it can be the opposite. It can be an extremely difficult situation because there is nothing for that young and growing and dynamic population to be doing. And so we have to work with Africa on, uh, on, on various different levels development, uh, sometimes humanitarian assistance where that's needed, the bubble development. Um, but of course, there are contexts in which we need to be looking at the security uh, dimension. And the Sahel is clearly one. We need to be able to support uh, the re-establishment of state authority in various countries. And in, in, in Mali, that's clearly the case, in Burkina Faso and Niger. And this represents, um, the, the lack of state authority in those countries represents a direct uh, threat to European security and represents an opportunity for terrorism, for international terrorist networks, Al-Qaeda and Islamic State affiliated networks that we cannot allow. Uh, we cannot allow anywhere in the world and we certainly cannot allow with such proximity. To, to Europe. So we have uh, a lot of self-interest mm -hmm. in uh, going uh, into the Sahel with a view to the stabilization of the situation, with a view to re-establishing state authority and creating a much more secure environment. The same goes for a couple of other parts of the African continent and mm -hmm. the Horn of Africa in uh, Central African Republic, uh, but uh, I think that one thing that has changed in the last uh, couple of years is that uh, the situation in Africa is seen uh, inside the European Union, not just as a matter of concern to the countries of the southern belt of the European Union, but as uh, something that matters to all. And you just have to look at the investment that Estonia, Sweden, Czech Republic are making in the Sahel to, to, to see this transformation, this change that has happened in the last couple of years, which is a very positive one. 
Unfortunately, I think one aspect that um, we need to work on in the relationship mm. with Africa is that we, we have five out of six of our uh, CSDP missions are, are in Africa. Indeed. And yet, and yet the leverage, the political leverage, the capacity that we have to influence the situation politically is, fa is far more reduced than it uh, should be. This is because, in my view, we do not have sufficient dialogue with the uh, relevant African political authorities, mm -hmm. um, the African regional organizations, the African Union, of course, but also uh, in the different parts of Africa, ECOWAS, SADC, uh, IGAD. Um, these are the institutions that are focused on finding political solutions, whereas what we're doing is uh, simply trying to uh, militarily, mil militarily stabilize uh, situations. We need to join up what we're doing with what they're doing, uh, which is why that in our presidency, we are um, establishing a political dialogue at the level of ministers between uh, European defense ministers and uh, the people who are responsible in the regional organizations to see how we can uh, really uh, employ our best efforts better together. Charles, that's really heartening to hear because I mean, we've recently uh, supported the establishment of a, a major uh, Africa Europe foundation, looking at a range of issues. And mm -hmm. I think well, one of the key messages of keep you keep on getting back is there's a need to uh, redraw the narrative of the relationship between the EU and Africa. And I, I like the way you just touched upon it, but didn't say it which is about mm -hmm. the fact that we need a different tone, don't we, or do we, Absolutely. that actually goes beyond the post-colonial tradition. Because what we found, in what I mean by that is you've had countries in the EU who've gone into, Europe, into Africa because they've had a relationship. But you don't have a united front, let alone shared capabilities or shared investment. It's still mm -hmm. based on post-colonial tram lines. If we take France, I'm, I point to yourselves and you can, you can answer for yourself in that regard, but also Germany and others. Whilst, whilst what we're seeing is China and Japan are buying up and investing in Africa in a major way. So there's a loss of kind of, there's a sense that we might miss the strategic opportunity of Africa if the EU doesn't get its act together. Yes, no, I completely agree. Of course, um, our dialogue is intense, and as in um, any family, it's always uh, both sides that Indeed. need to make uh, make adjustments. And uh, you know, we have there has been a consistent effort to engage with the African Union, so, but uh, this is, has not really produced the kind of results that we want. I think that the the best way is actually to step a little bit away from the the broad theoretical concepts that always leads to an analysis of what happened in colonialism and how this has infected everything that happened since uh, but just to go to very practical issues how are we going to work together in the sahel how are we going to uh, use the what each can bring to the table in order to um, serve our common objectives because our objectives are absolutely um, convergent in, in the sahel as in so many other parts and the only way of doing this really is by engaging uh, systematically at the political level. Okay. I think that uh, Ursula von der Leyen was right to make a first major trip. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, most Indeed. political traveling has, uh, has ceased or, or uh, been greatly reduced. But she was right to go to Addis Ababa and uh, to engage with the African Union. Uh, we need to do it at various different levels. At the level of ministers of defense, it's something that has not happened and uh, that, we, that we would want to promote now during our presidency. Joel, thank you. And I want to um, conclude our conversation by turning our attention back to citizens, if I may. There's been much been made of the elections pre uh, the new commission, you know, the highest turnout in a decade. We've seen um, almost like a moment of arrested development in relation to the Conference on the Future of Europe, which will be now launched on the 9th of May, Europe Day. We have a Eurobarometer result saying, you know, EU citizens are really hopeful and really committed to the EU. Now, if for this not to be something which becomes a hollow promise, um, from your perspective, there are what do you think is the kind of conversation we should be having with citizens, especially in the space of peace, security, and defense in Europe? We know that there's a lot of talk that Conference of the Future Europe is about rethinking what Europe might be, 
We have the new Bauhaus initiative, which is about creating more sustainable, beautiful Europe. But in the missing link in all of those conversations is at the heart of citizens' feelings, there's a sense of personal and community safety and peace. So from your perspectives, concluding remarks, tell me, share with us what you think could happen or should happen or is happening in relation to citizens in Europe in, in, in the context of peace, security, defence. I believe the peace and security matters should be a very important part of the Conference of Europe because uh, this is a, a, an area where um, we have not previously in, in, in previous generations thought of uh, being, you know, we thought of uh, Europe as a civilian power, as a power that uh, would operate in a, in a postmodern world through its, um, its, its, its soft power, its influence, and its capacity to shape uh, multilateralism. And unfortunately, the world has not conformed to our fantasies. And this means that now in 2021, when we're thinking about the future of Europe, we need to put right in the, in the center of that discussion what we should be doing together as Europeans to promote the security of, of, uh, of our populations. Um, it's not just a matter of traditional defense. It's a matter of what has come to be called uh, resilience, a matter of identifying you know, the ways in which we can reduce our vulnerabilities to an unpredictable uh, exterior. It's also, I think, very important for us to be able to um, use this issue area to uh, change the way that we think about Europe. It actually, in the last year and, and a bit, so years since uh, we, the pandemic has been upon us, Europe has moved forward in spectacular ways. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of, for, for example, the decisions that have been taken uh, with respect to the recovery fund, uh, which open up uh, completely different prospects for the future. Um, I'm thinking of the way in which we came together to procure uh, vaccines. Unfortunately, those issues yep. have seemed to become forgotten when, mm. with all of the focus on uh, some hiccups that have happened in the in the vaccination process, which which of course uh, you know merits our attention. But the big picture is actually a very positive one, and we need to. Uh, uh, get uh, a way in which we can transmit the importance of what has happened and use that as a trampoline for our ambitions. Uh, otherwise, our ambitions will always be low level because uh, of the focus on things that have not gone quite as perfectly as we would have liked them to, to go. Peace and security, I think, therefore has to be a central part of our discussion about the future of Europe. And I think that strategic compass will help us to do that. And, and the world outside us uh, should uh, also be helping to focus our minds on, on what is really important. Joao, thank you very much. I suppose thank one you. of the reflections I have when you, when you spoke and ref referred to hiccups, um, those hiccups become political nightmares because in the lived reality of people that all around them, they see uh, an absence of um, the force of might of really responding. And unfortunately, there are more people that are prepared to sort of jump on what you refer to as hiccups as being something fundamentally wrong about the EU and it can't get its act together rather than, as you say, there are some steps that have taken beforehand, which actually po uh, point to a different type of EU capacity. And I suppose the challenge will be, are we able to make that transition politically so that we are much more bolder, much more together in this space? And I suppose finally, the one thing I wanted to kind of give you, you know, 60 seconds or so to respond to is the, the impact of digitalization. Um, what we've known through the health crisis and the economic crisis, that digitalization has become um, fundamentally a driver for how we consume, how we communicate, and, and it will have an impact on peace, security, defense, surely. What's your view on the impact of digitalization in the future? Well, digitalization is uh, disruptive. Earlier, I mentioned the, the disruptive uh, technologies, the emerging technologies that can be very disruptive, and digitalization of our societies and of our economies 
can be disruptive in both senses, in the most positive sense, and also in the sense of underlining our vulnerabilities. And we, of course, have to really explore the, the potential without, um, without creating uh, for ourselves also enormous difficulties that can arise from uh, attacks on our capacity to organize ourselves as, as societies. And it's easy to imagine cyber attacks or very simple old fashioned hacking of cables and so on. So um, uh, digitalization, I think uh, we need to be using, I, I'm obviously as defense minister focused on what this can mean in mm -hmm. terms of artificial intelligence for our defense capabilities, but we need to uh, focus on its positives without taking our eye off the vulnerabilities and while developing systematically at the same time, uh, responses to those vulnerabilities. That's the defense uh, part of the equation that needs to be taken on board. Joao, thank you very much. You've been very generous. I've taken a lot of your time. Thank and you. I'm it's sure, been a pleasure. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of our viewers will have found that very interesting and will want to engage further in this. Um, and thank you for being with us on Critical Thinking Life. And we'll look forward to welcoming you again. We have a number of events coming up. And I know that we're hoping to welcome you again for the launch of our Sahel study. And so we're looking forward to that. But to our viewers, thank you very much for watching. Keep an eye on our website for future Critical Thinking Lives. You've been listening to Damendra Kanani in conversation with Joao Carvino, uh, the Minister of Defence for Portugal. Thank you very much. Take care, be safe and mind your distance. Thank you very much.